I thank the Honourable Member for his speech and now look to Professor Sir Ian Wilmot to continue the case for the proposition. Hear, hear. Mr President, ladies and gentlemen, I am really genuinely delighted to take part in this debate because this is such an important subject. If we're going to get the best out of these newly emerging techniques which will be described, it is absolutely essential that we have permissive, appropriate regulation of the use of the technology. And I hope that this discussion, this debate, will stimulate people to think about that and perhaps at later opportunities take part in public campaigns and referendums were there to be such a thing to support the development and use of the technique. As a way of illustrating what may come in the future, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what has already been done with manipulation of human DNA, what we've learned. And then I'll move on to consider the future techniques that uh, are being discussed. The first thing that was done with DNA was to inject it into cells, inject a small segment into cells in order to see what effect that fragment had upon the functioning of the cells. And it was in this way for the first time, actually only 30 or 40 years ago, that the first of a group of factors were identified which have the effect of modifying the functioning of other genes, known collectively as transcription factors. Absolutely critical first steps in molecular biology. And I'm going to come back later on to a very important use of selected transcription factors in regenerative medicine. The next step was perhaps to introduce the same segments of DNA into embryos as a way of getting them integrated into embryos and then into offspring. That made it possible with refinement to define the tissues and the stages of development in which these particular fragments were active and led to important new understanding in development. You know, a single cell, tenth of a millimetre in diameter, becomes an adult person. I'm not holding myself forward as a particularly spectacular example, but, <laughs> um, but, but it all comes from a single cell of that size because of very complex interactions between different genes. And this was one of the most important ways of understanding how they work, how they, what their roles are. Of course, people began to think in terms of studying what happened in disease, genetic disease, and fragments injected into animals, human DNA taken from patients with inherited disease, created animal models which, which exhibited the disease characteristics of the human. And these have been used very, very extensively to understand diseases such as, for example, uh, ALS, uh, motor neuron disease as we tend to call it in this country. And to be able to understand that the disease actually involves two cells, not just the motor neurons, but the neighbour cells. It's commonly described in the community that work on this disease that the neighbour cells fan the flames because they exacerbate the effects of the abnormality in the other cell population. This sort of knowledge is absolutely critical if you're going to learn to understand disease and then treat it. So there's been a great deal of knowledge from hundreds of small experiments, some of them involving animals as I've already mentioned, using small fragments of human DNA often, even though the animal was different, it was a mouse, because of the conservation of genes across different mammals it's possible to use human DNA in these very basic studies to understand things. As a final example, it became possible to remove or to stop particular genes functioning by precise modification. So you have the opportunity to both introduce a fragment to see what the positive effect is, as well as removing the equivalent fragment to see if you get the converse effect as a sort of control for your original observations. So we have lots of methods being used, lots of important new knowledge, and also opportunities for the first time 
to study the basic mechanisms of inherited diseases and with a view to being able to look for the first therapies. And if you have animal models, it's possible to screen small molecules to see if you can find any that prevent the harmful effects of the disease. This is not a cure. This is present, preventing the harmful effect of the abnormal gene. Now, of course, it's quite inconceivable that these <coughs> approaches will stop. But what will happen is that the new techniques which are being mentioned, CRISPRs particularly, but I'm going to go on to, to discuss stem cells as well, will be used in important new studies to gain better knowledge of inherited diseases and in time come forward with treatments uh, to cure the disease. Notice I've used the word cure. Um, to actually to remove the thing which is going to, has the potential to be harmful. So the two new techniques which are going to contribute such a lot are CRISPRs, which have the ability to make very precise genetic change. It was mentioned earlier by the, the first speaker to support the uh, proposition. Um, they are able not only to remove segments of a gene, but to replace the segment with something else and to do it usually with great accuracy. So this has transformed this sort of approach in the last four years. I think it is only four years since the systems were first available. And they are much easier to make, quicker to make, and easier to use than any previous methods of making precise genetic change. So they're certainly going to transform research. What we're going to move on to discuss is how are we going to use them, not just to get new knowledge, but to develop new therapies. The other important opportunity is being provided by cells which emerged from the cloning research. And so, because I have some familiarity with that work, I'm going to talk to you about cloning and then go on to the cells. Cloning involves two cells. It involves an egg, in the case of the sheep experiments, recovered from a ewe when usually she would have been mated. And the chromosomes are removed from the eggs using micro-manipulators on, mounted on sophisticated microscopes <coughs> and with people who have great pa patience and manual dexterity. Not me. <laughs> the second cell provides the new genetic information, the nucleus which is transferred in. And as many of you will know, the cell uh, from the Dolly experiment came from mam mammary gland of a pregnant ewe. The use of a cell from this tissue suggested the name of Dolly for the lamb that resulted from this experiment as a gesture of respect for the spectacular mammary glands of Dolly Parton. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can tell the ones who hadn't heard the joke, can't you? Yeah. Uh, uh. I have to give the credit to the stockman who was looking after the pregnant ewes for uh, coming forward with the joke. <laughs> Dolly Parton's manager was reputed to have said, there is no such thing as bad publicity. <laughs> so we have the two cells, and an electric current was used to fuse the two cells together, and so introduce the nucleus from the mammary cell into the egg, and at the same time to stimulate the egg to begin development. Now the transferred nucleus had been functioning in a mammary cell. We don't know, we have to admit, we don't know exactly what type of cell, but it was functioning for mammary gland. And simply by putting it into an egg, in appropriate timings and so on, factors in the egg change the functioning of those uh, nuclei, those, that nuclei, those genes, to be appropriate for an early embryo, so that it became able to support development all the way through to term uh, of a healthy lamb. Startling manipulation, in this case of sheep DNA. Offspring of several species were cloned by the Roslin protocol, but it was unsuccessful in primates, including humans. During the last year or so, two groups working independently showed that this reflected particular sensitivity to handling of the eggs of primates. And when the protocol was modified to take account of this, um, development of, of cloned primate embryos was similar to that of other animals. So now 
there isn't a, a group of animals which cannot be cloned by a modification of the Roslin procedure. This ultimately establishing then a very different method of manipulating human DNA. The birth of Dolly showed two things and raised one very important question. That donor cell must still have had all of the DNA which is necessary to support development to term. This is, was a matter of controversy before her birth. And the second thing, it showed that the egg, factors in the egg, are able to reprogram, as the word we use, to change the functioning of the genes in order to get normal development. And the question? If the egg can do this, what other factors are able to remodel gene expression in this dramatic way? It was 10 years later when two labs, work, again working independently, reported that it was possible by use of carefully selected proteins to change skin cells so that they became very similar indeed to mouse embryonic stem cells. These proteins are transcription factors, the very type of protein that I mentioned right at the very beginning. The thing about embryo stem cells is that they can grow to produce very many cells while retaining the ability to form all, all tissues, all different tissues. And these cells that were produced in the laboratory have that characteristic. And so they're known as induced pluripotent cells, because pluripotent is the characteristic of forming all of the tissues. And so they're no, no, known by their acronym of IPS cells. Further work showed that the same effect is possible with human cells. And later still, that it is possible not only to go from a somatic tissue down to an early embryonic state, but to go from one somatic tissue directly to another without going down to the embryonic state. So in principle, there are people who believe that it is possible to do exactly that, to go from, say, a liver cell to a neural cell by using the right cocktail of proteins. So this means it's possible that we can take cells, skin cells, blood cells, from a person who has a damaged population of cells, change them to iPS cells, change them into the type of cell which is missing. <coughs> And there are definitely groups all around the world who are working towards this objective. For example, to repair macular degeneration, degeneration in the most sensitive part of the eye, which if it fails to function normally, is clouded over by a sort of a grey mass so that you lose all the definition. It may one day be possible to produce gametes, sperm and eggs, from the same type of cell. Um, for people who don't have any of them. Not all of our DNA is in chromosomes. Some DNA is in our mitochondria, the powerhouses in our cells which provide all of the energy, most of the energy. And this has been a source of great difficulty in understanding the cause of the disease and coming forward with strategies for therapy. And you may know that it may have noticed in this country that the government approved a procedure for taking parts of three embryos in order to produce one which has everything that it needs. An alternative way of treating this condition may well be to use uh, CRISPRs to remove the damaged genes in the mitochondria. In a single cell of an embryo, it's possible to think of addressing that issue. And there are, again are people uh, working with this in mind. So in conclusion then, manipulation of human DNA has taught us an enormous amount. More importantly, new treatments are coming forward for diseases for which at the present time there is no treatment, like the mitochondrial disease, like macular degeneration, like many others which will be mentioned later by my colleague. I urge you to support this motion, not only here, but outside in the, in the rest of the world. You may want to think that by the time you get to be my age, it will benefit you greatly if these diseases are being cured. So that's another reason why you may want to support this motion.